So first of all, I just want to start out by welcoming everyone and thanking you all for joining this latest installment of Powering Business with Blockchain. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this series, uh, just for some background, uh, during these sessions, we really like to host leaders and executives from across different industries to discuss how they are thinking about blockchain technology in the context of their businesses and the industries in which they work, how their efforts have evolved and really grown over time, and to really ultimately showcase real use cases in the space. So by way of introduction, I'm Morgan Krupetsky, Director of Business Development for Institutions and Capital Markets at Ava Labs. Today, I'm really excited to be hosting a couple of our institutional partners, Siddhartha and Eric Mitzel from Intain. Uh, together, they are bringing structured finance on chain, and we'll go into exactly what that means and, and how they do it. Um, both Sid and Eric have been in the space for a while now, in, uh, in crypto years, probably uh, many, many, many decades. Um, and their first platform, Intain Admin, has already administered over $6 billion in asset-backed securities to date. So we're especially excited that they chose Avalanche for their Intain Markets build. Uh, we'll go into more details about the structured finance space overall, the possible places where the industry might be right for disentanglement, uh, what Intain is aiming to solve, and why blockchain, especially Avalanche's subnet architecture, was an ideal solution for them. So first, um, I'd love to start out by asking you both to introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us a bit about yourselves, your backgrounds, and maybe just a high-level overview of what Intain is, and then we can go into um, more detail from there. So Siddhartha, let me turn it over to you. Um, thanks, Morgan. Uh, Siddharth, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Intain. Uh, my background is financial services operations, first as part of a joint venture with Deutsche Bank. And then I ran a joint venture with State Street as its CEO, uh, running fund admin and custody operations. Uh, founded Intain with the idea of kind of digitizing structured finance. A blockchain being a critical component of it uh, back in 2018, and we can discuss the rest as we go along. Okay, yeah, uh, Eric Mitzel, I uh, joined uh, Intain about a year and a half ago um, with uh, the interest of, of seeing a better uh, process flow. I came from the, the world of administration, uh, corporate trust uh, with Zions Bank, and, and before that with Bank of New York Mellon, um, and administering the, the structured product uh, after issuance. And so often the trustee was the, the point of kind of uh, data reconciliation and interpretation of collateral uh, triggers and covenants and uh, distributing payment to the investors. Anyhow, it's, it's a uh, process that uh, is very laborious and certainly uh, prone to, to a lot of headaches. And so uh, some of the solutions that Intain presented through the in initial product, Intain Admin, uh, certainly resolved some of that. Uh, and, and then from there, we capitalize and, and build on that further with um, Intain Markets. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and so before we go into uh, potentially Intain itself and kind of how it solves some of those issues, um, let's open it up to you guys. And just if you could um, kind of just go through the current state of the structured finance industry, particularly for those who might not be as familiar, I think, with this audience. We generally have a mix of, of backgrounds and, and people coming from different industries. So for those who might not necessarily be as familiar, maybe give, give us a quick rundown. What does the industry entail? What works? What doesn't work? What's the size of the market? Like, What is the market opportunity that we're talking about? Um, any kind of context um, that we could get, I think would be really helpful to, to kind of set the table. Sure. So yeah, I'll give it a shot and people who are from the structured finance background, just kind of excuse me for being, for using some loose terms, which may not be uh, very technically specific because the aim is that everybody understands that. Uh, so if, if you talk to a lay person, just think of a person who goes to borrow money to buy a house that person may not realize that his house is not being financed by the bank that's lending, but actually are in effect by someone else's pension fund investment. And what's really happening is that all these loans by that lender are getting pooled with an issuer. Uh, that issuer then goes to a verification agent uh, who may be a custodian bank who verifies those. Then it is underwritten by an underwriter who creates tranches or slices of that loan or loan pool rather. 
uh, which becomes securities, uh, the low risk, low reward tranches may get invested into by pension funds, the high risk, high reward tranches may get invested into by a hedge fund, and then things in between. Uh, once that investment takes place, uh, month on month collections for those loans would happen by a servicer. Uh, and actually, before the investment happens, a rating agency would rate those after the investment happens, servicer collects the monies, and the monies are collected, it goes to a trust bank who then uses the whole model or structure that was created on how the money should be distributed between the pension fund and the hedge fund and everybody in between. And based on that, they distribute the money. So this is a process in which somebody's mortgage is really being financed through, as we saw, the lender, the issuer, custodian, underwriter, rating agency, investor, servicer, trust bank, so on and so forth. So that's how complex the process is. Now, many people's understanding of structured finance is based on either the havoc that was caused by the Lehman collapse or the movie Big Shot. Now, I generally avoid referring to the Big Shot because a lot of people in the industry think that it unfairly demonizes them. But still, you get a sense of how many parties are involved and how this happens, which means that there's just layers and layers of costs and layers and layers of opacity. And because the process is so cumbersome, just to give you an example, even on our platform this month, a lot of payments based on how the traditional process works will get processed on 25th of March for the month of February. So one way of looking at it is that it is a 25-day delay, but it's not only a delay in payment processing, it is on 25th of March that the investor will get a report about their portfolio, which also means that if something happened on their portfolio on 1st of February, the investor is getting a view on that occurrence 55 days later, or in case of February, and if you're pedantic, 53 days later, maybe. Uh, so that is the first order problem. The second order problem is that these layered costs and delayed information mean that a deal less than $100, $150 million is not viable in the US. So the lenders then have to hold these loans in warehouses till it accrues to a size big enough to do a deal. Or even for bigger lenders, like in current circumstances, when mortgage volumes are down, they have to keep accumulating those till the deal is possible. So that's really the problem statement of an industry which currently does $2 trillion in issuances, has $13 trillion in outstanding. And in a very, very recent thing, everybody would have known that 60-70% uh, of Silicon Valley Bank's asset book was in mortgage-backed securities. So there's two things there, Siddhartha, that I think I just would, would want to emphasize. One, I think um, the, the loan performance, the underlying loan performance, investors generally get a sense of several, several days, you mentioned 50, 55 days later, and generally in the form of an Excel sheet or a PDF, which um, you know, is still is very commonplace today. Um, and then in addition to that, the mentioning of the fact that because of all these intermediaries, as well as um, the, the way in which the loan is administered, you know, sub $100 million deals are not really economically viable. And so some of these things I know Intain seeks to solve um, or does solve. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about Intain Admin, um, as well as the Intain Markets platform. And you know what that what that seeks to do in terms of um, potential efficiencies. I know I know you guys tout boring blockchain as a way to really kind of uh, disentangle and nuance some of the um, you know nuances in, in the industry today. But how how blockchain is helping to kind of power some of these some of these solutions um, and really not necessarily and, and you guys know this better than I do not necessarily. Um, disintermediate but disentangle some of these processes um so maybe eric if you want to if you want to kind of just go through the platform itself and maybe how it can kind of address some of those issues that siddhartha laid out um i think that would be helpful sure thanks morgan yeah it, it i think i'd start with uh on that premise of of uh 
looking not to disintermediate, right? Um, because our current partners are financial institutions and we developed admin platform first, which which effectively runs uh, data uh, through a blockchain. We write smart contracts that, that govern uh, the conditions that are present within the trust indenture and responding to the collateral as it's being serviced. So um, the fact that we you know built that platform in, in um, the administration support of trust banks uh, certainly amplifies the fact that, that we were looking to to help them automate their process. Uh, so efficient intermediation, I think, is the is the uh, term that uh, Siddhartha has coined. Uh, and, and I also like to, to say automate rather than eliminate. Right. So the, the counterparties that are involved in the transactions uh, in structured finance are many and in, in often cases they're required to be there by law. Right. And so um, in, in that case, uh, you know, many, I think, in, in kind of the blockchain space might have thought uh, it's kind of an impure uh, approach, uh, which is to to connect these counterparties, um, but certainly in doing so, right, we've, we've de designed an infrastructure in which uh, we can um, pr process the data moving from one counterparty to the next with that trust, that transparency, that truth that blockchain promises, uh, while creating the infrastructure for each uh, of those counterparties to uh, trust one another, right, that the information they're receiving is accurate, it is uh, verified, and, and from there, uh, some of the enhanced tools that we add into that, the tape cracker that we use uh, to reconcile the servicer, uh, which is the collateral of the actual underlying asset performance, uh, to, to absorb that information and reconcile it, the ability to write the smart contracts to dictate how the um, governing document stipulates who gets paid what, uh, and, and then the connection uh, with our AI-enabled uh, tool to verify the loan as it's being uh, brought on to chain. Uh, all of these things together, um, again, we're still working with the counterparties, but integrating them in the same ecosystem. And from there, that's where we can drive down transaction costs and certainly uh, deal sizes as well. And I think, um, you know, our target is to, to deliver about a two thirds reduction in overall transaction costs uh, compared to the traditional finance. And it's tough to compare apples to, to oranges because what we are saying is that you can also do, do smaller deal sizes, right? So the $100 million traditional auto back securitization could still run through intake markets. We'd love to see that. Uh, but we can also, because of that uh, integration and automation, uh, can bring that transaction size down to $10 million, uh, or less potentially. Let's pull the screen up here. Oh, and this kind of goes through, uh, actually, if one of you guys want to kind of go through some of these efficiencies, I know, um, Eric, you mentioned the deal size in terms of making smaller deal sizes, i.e. eight to $10 million um, economically viable. Um, I think it'll be maybe helpful to kind of go through some of these other things as well in terms of um, the costs as well as the, the timelines and where that comes from uh, as it relates to Intain. I think that would just be helpful as well. And, and one thing that I would also emphasize that I get really excited about is I think oftentimes um, in in this industry, we see a lot of reports and articles referencing, you know, high level efficiencies, cost savings. But you guys have been at this for so long that you're actually able to, in a range, quantify some of these some of these efficiencies. So, would love for for one of you to kind of review what that looks like, and also, um, you know, where that comes from or how that's able to be achieved. Okay, I'll give it a shot. So you mentioned about the Excel and emails. So yes, it's an industry which really uses emails as the workflow and Excel as, in a way, the system of record and computation. So think of it as we are replacing the email as workflow and Excel as system of record with a blockchain and then computation through smart contracts. So what is then happening is that the whole data flow between the issuer, custodian, servicer, trustee, investor is automated on a blockchain. There is no reconciliation then required between different entities because earlier everybody was having their own systems shipping around Excels, which then have to be reconciled that everybody agrees to what the data is. So that process is completely eliminated. And because that process is eliminated, then we can write smart contracts on whatever needs to be computed out of it, which as Eric said, that these indenture have all those I means it's called structured finance because these are structured deals with a lot of complex computations and then we can execute them. Uh, so that's really where the saving comes from. Now, where the transparency comes from in real time is that now it is not that there is an intermediary which is picking data from one source, aggregating, analyzing and giving it to the investor. Think from investor's point of view. The investor has invested into a security which is backed, let's say, by 5,000 loans. In the platform now, the investor can really zoom into his security and seize all those 5,000 loans. 
can zoom into every one of those 5,000 loans and will see every single month's payments. So what was 55 days delayed and aggregated is absolutely granular and real time. And because this whole process is automated, it reduces the cost significantly. There are other elements as well. And we can discuss as we go along, for example, we treat this really as a digital platform. So we are not telling all the stakeholders that come to this network because this is the best blockchain network in town and it's a fancy thing. So you should come aboard. We are saying that it is providing you the best digital toolkit for your solution problem. So the verification agent, for example, is verifying these loans and certifying. We are giving them an AI tool which already reads those loans, reconciles, makes it available so that they just look at the exception and certify on the blockchain. Uh, so their task is reducing by 70, 80%. And that's actually even before the data entered the blockchain. So it's really a digital automation platform which uses blockchain as a workflow and as a system of record. Yeah, and I would um, add in that sense of, of uh, as Siddhartha was mentioning, the, the ability to drill down into the loans. In time, we think as well that the platform um, from repeat issuers and repeat investors that are on the platform, obviously you get comfortable with the process, but over time as well, you're doing some of your own due diligence in a way. As the deal's being structured, you can drill down into the loans and see the concentration limits that are going to get structured uh, into that potential uh, tranche for investment. And so you have the ability to kind of review and assess, yeah, you know, I think there's 10% too many loans out of Florida. Let's let's uh, kick those out. And then the issuer can replace those with, with other loans that have been mapped to the pool. Uh, and that drives down some of the transaction costs that, that occur from that warehouse facility to the securitization facility from the underwriter. And then there's loan substitutions because those assets are performing as the deal is being structured. So again, in totality, as, as the platform matures and more uh, deals and, and volume um, are processed through Intay Markets, we, we certainly think uh, there'll be that ability to, to do deals even faster uh, with less, um, you know, kind of data discovery and, and due diligence. Obviously, you want to do the proper due diligence, but that you'll have a way uh, to do that uh, directly within the platform itself. And Siddhartha, you mentioned also um, the use of AI. Can you guys talk about that a little bit in terms of um, the role that that plays um, and how that, uh, you know, uh, interweaves with the blockchain component? Sure. Um, so currently there are these entities called verification agents, mostly they are custodians, but they may not be, uh, who have to verify that the data about the loan that is being offered for structuring and investment, that data is correct. Uh, so what they would do is they have all the loan contracts available to them. They will match it against the data uh, and then they issue a certificate. The way we are using it is we are automating this process using AI. Um, so even before the verification agent logs in, the moment those loans are available in a set folder, the AI engine scans through, realizes that these additional loans are available, reads through all those loans, extracts the information that is required, matches it against the data that has been provided, creates a reconciliation report, which when the verification agent logs in, sees it as an exception report. The AI engines today are not 100% accurate. So the exception could be because there's genuine data discrepancy or our AI engine could have made a mistake. Uh, the verification agent reviews uh, if it's a mistake by the AI engine, corrects and certifies. The moment they certify, now this is a due diligence information available. And that certificate is on blockchain. The data or the files go into an IPF, IPFS folder and an NFT is created for each loan, which means now for whatever happens through the life cycle of these loans, which is it's structured, resold in secondary market, I actually created an NFT, which creates a record and a tracking mechanism for us through the life cycle. So it is from blockchain industry parlance, the onboarding of real world asset on chain is what we are solving through this process, which is a two-step certification in a way. An AI engine has verified, then a financial institution has reviewed and certified for an NFT to be created. So it's not that a security was just tokenized and given for investment. When a person is looking at their security, they, as I said, zoom into the security to see a loan and they are assured that this loan is verified and certified on chain as an NFT by the custodian. And that, that's helpful. And I know that we'll, we'll go into a demo um, as well uh, of the platform. 
Um, maybe before we go into that, uh, if you guys can talk a little bit about some of the partnerships you've been able to cultivate with um, different players within the financial services industry, I think that would be helpful in terms of um, giving a sense of really, I mean, credit to you guys in terms of the amount of um, visibility and adoption you've been able to kind of garner um, in, in over these over these past few years. So um, maybe Eric, if you want to kind of speak to to those partnerships so far, at least those that, that are that are publicly announced, um, sure. and then we can kind of go into a demo. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I know. Happy to do so. Um, and and you're right. I think um, for us, obviously, the, the delivering the proof of concept uh, of the platform into an admin first, uh, you know, was was certainly a tall order to try to get banks comfortable. Uh, that happened before my time, so that goes to, to Siddharth and team. Uh, but signing on that first partner, uh, which was Wisfis Wilmington Savings Fund Society. Uh, which was uh, operating, uh, uh, you know, trust business for ABS and MBS uh, transactions. Uh, I think they saw the advantage uh, that we presented uh, in comparison to other tools that, that that would exist in terms of trust administration for structured product. There's a host of other, uh, com- um, you know, competitor uh, software solutions, but generally a trustee would have to cobble three or four of those together in order to, to get a holistic solution. And our platform, Engine Admin, provided that holistic solution while promoting um, kind of the efficiencies that uh, are generated in that data analytics uh, that can be garnered from, from uh, hosting some of the smart contracts and the waterfall calculations on chain. Uh, so uh, Wispis was one of our first partners. Um, we've got a multitude of deals uh, that we run for them on the admin platform. Um, UMB, United Missouri Bank, was another uh, trustee partner uh, that's come onto our, our platform, Intain Admin. Uh, they also uh, use our AI verification tool uh, for the purpose of, of uh, loan and uh, contract validation. Uh, and so uh, that's a kind of a modular solution that also connects into, into the marketplace that uh, Sid Arthur was mentioning a bit ago. Um, you know, they're also these trustee partners um, have also agreed to sign on and serve as uh, verification agents, uh, custodians, and trustees within the Intain Markets platform. So when we go through a demo, you'll you'll see kind of those nodes, uh, and each of those participants would be uh, some of our current partners. Um, you know, we completed a. Uh, uh, proof of concept in an, under an innovation challenge with Wells Fargo, uh, in which we were uh, the only blockchain uh, company selected out of 200, I think, that entered the competition. Uh, and uh, that's where we really demonstrated the the ability of, of uh, uh, Intay Markets and what it can do for uh, structured credit, um, generating efficiencies, smaller deal sizing, uh, all the things that we've talked about. Um, in terms of additional partners, um, you know, they announced it in a, a I think it was an October uh, asset fact alert publication, so structured finance specific publication. But Wilmington Trust uh, has also uh, entered into uh, the contract uh, process uh, to use us for some of their servicing or administration of, of deals. Um, and we've and we've been in conversations now with a number of larger uh, institutions, uh, large kind of uh, bulge bracket banks, smaller community banks as well, uh, for, for various uh, factors. From a community bank perspective, uh, the appeal of Inte Markets would allow them uh, the the access to structured credit that they typically wouldn't be able to do. Uh, obviously, they're generating loans uh, at a regular basis, but they tend not to have the volume to get through a warehouse facility into the securitization model. Uh, and so, being able to do smaller deal sizes and attract um, even counterparty investors through their network, right? There's other community banks that may buy their uh, home mortgage portfolio or their auto loan receivables. Uh, so it's uh, really been a, a nice uh, couple of months since uh, the effective launch, uh, gaining a lot of traction uh, and a number of current financial partners. So Siddharth may have some additional uh, commentary on, on who it is that we work with. No, you uh, actually... captured it. The, uh, WSFS and UMB existing partners, uh, Wilmington Trust, which is part of MNT Bank, uh, without us saying much, it's what they said publicly that they would be moving on to our platform on Intain Admin and Intain Markets was piloted over six months with Wells Fargo. So that's uh, what we can talk publicly at this stage. Actually, let me let me ask you guys um, because you've been in you know multi month long discussions with these partners as well as others, and you know given. Given uh, our, our audience probably is a mix of those probably partnering with institutions as well as those coming from institutions, so would love to hear from you in terms of how you've how you've gotten institutions comfortable with the idea of using the the platform, which is obviously on on blockchain. What those conversations have been like, um, and maybe, maybe some of the terminology or the way that you've basically just 
gotten them to focus on the fact that this is blockchain. It's not some of the other things that you hear about in the news and how you distilled that. Would love to kind of hear your insights since you've been deep in these in these discussions for mul for multiple months, if not years. Um, but, but would love to kind of hear um, you know, the 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 pitch or the the ways by which you've gotten people um, you know, not only comfortable but excited, frankly, about the platform. Yeah, so I think it's in two parts. One is about the solution. The other is about us as a company. So about the solution, as I said, that uh, we built it as a digital platform, not just a blockchain network. Uh, so people, financial institutions that we talk to understand digital technologies and the efficiencies it brings. Uh, blockchain provides the data rails. Uh, so in, that's why we were almost treated like pariahs in a lot of these early blockchain conferences. We sat out all the ICO, STO, NFT hype cycles in favor of just focusing on a compliant and comprehensive digital platform. And second, we work with all the trust intermediaries which are required for compliance. In fact, we are reducing compliance costs rather than sidestepping compliance. So that's as far as the digital solution is concerned. And then as you go into the architecture, Intain admin runs on private blockchains. When we decided to launch Intain markets, and we can discuss that in detail, that's the reason we chose an Avalanche subnet because uh, it caters to some of our requirements. The other part of partnering with uh, financial institutions is how we run as an enterprise. Um, and I know there are a lot of kind of philosophical convictions in the blockchain industry about DAOs, et cetera. Um, in our company, all our financial institution partners can go to a due diligence folder and check background verification reports of our employees, uh, which include so fact reports, et cetera. So there is uh, nobody who's anonymous. Uh, everybody, as I said, is an employee background check. Uh, people will find it very boring, uh, but if you go through processes like ISO 27001 certification. So in a typical blockchain firm, which is five developers and seven, eight marketing people, does a lot of exciting things. Uh, we do 70% of the things which are really, really boring, bureaucratic. And also because we have platforms and production, so we have to take care of support and testing none of which sounds as innovative and exciting and world changing as you would assume, but they are absolutely essential to be working with financial institutions. And I guess almost all the management comes from the other side. Uh, so that helps means we haven't drunk any Kool-Aid at all. I mean, I think this a lot of the things that you're that you guys are are um, kind of making more efficient and, and speeding up. It's to your point, it's maybe the less sexy things, but for me, it's definitely more exciting because, you know, especially coming from a traditional financial services background, you really come to appreciate um, where some of these efficiencies could be could be realized, and to kind of see it. It, it not only talked about, but actually in production and working, I think um, is particularly exciting, at least for me and hopefully our, our audience. Also well. how they calculate savings, right? sorry, to, uh, yeah, yeah, on the efficiency part, because so if you have to go and sell the idea that there will be a blockchain based future and Web3 will come, you will mostly be talking to the digital assets team, which are always helpful. Uh, but in our case, because we are a very narrowly focused solution, we work only with structured finance. So the structured finance team has to buy into it. Otherwise, we are not offering any infrastructure, nothing. Which means that the digital solution business case has to stand on its own. So I should be able to tell a verification agent that you come onto our platform, the AI automation is reducing the cost by 70%. What happens with this blockchain future, Web3, DeFi, does not matter to you next month, you are saving 70% costs. To a paying agent, we are saying that all your payment waterfalls are getting automated. Next month, you are saving 70, 80% costs. So that's just in terms of how we approach institutions. That's actually a good point because oftentimes I think, um, you know, the approach is, it's almost like you're fitting, what do they say, a solution in search of a problem. Like, how can we use this technology? What is the problem that we're trying to solve. But in, in your case, it's very much the the other way around, which I almost feel like is the the better and, and correct way to go, where you've identified very clear pain points um, and areas for improvement. 
And blockchain and AI just happen to be the means by which those things are solved, um, which I think to your point, Sarah, that really resonates with, with business people who have a business to run day in, day out, and who have very concrete pain points and frictions. And your solution, which happens to run on, on chain, solves that, or at least makes it better. Um, so I think that's definitely the, the right way to kind of uh, approach it. Um, let's talk a little bit about, and I know we'll, we'll do a, a demo in a little bit, but let's talk about the markets platform. I know you, you chose to build Intain Admin on, on Hyperledger, and then for your next um, product, Intain Markets, made the decision to, um, you know, to choose Avalanche, specifically Avalanche subnets and its architecture that, that comes along with it. Um, tell us a little bit about the the platform, the decision to launch on a subnet, what informed that, and um, and then we can go from there. Uh, sure. So our experience has been on a private blockchain, uh, which is Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we have done MVPs on R3 Corda. So we were always clear that we'll be on private networks um, as much as that gets hated in the blockchain industry. Now, you cannot run a markets platform on a private network because there are many components of the markets uh, which have to access, in a way, features provided by a public blockchain network. Um, we never had an option where something which met our requirements um, could be used. And hence, means we, as you mentioned, we started in 2018. So we are really old in the space and uh, we never had a tech platform which we could use that met our requirements. And then we came across subnets. Uh, the initial discussion obviously helped because we are talking to people in the Avalabs team uh, who understood financial services. So that helps just in terms of communicating because we are not talking to a cult, uh, which is a big problem we have had with a lot of uh, kind of blockchain ecosystems. That means we are financial services people, we can't communicate with cults. Um, so once we started developing that subnet provides us three four things one our infrastructure is completely us housed uh, so every single server vm is inside united states and hence every piece of data is inside us uh, i know blockchain industry does not like us too much these days uh, but for us it's completely housed inside us which without subnet we couldn't have ensured every validator is identified by us KYC by us. And in future, we may even require validators to have certifications like FINRA certification, et cetera. So every validator that way is uh, identified. These are two kind of really critical things. And then because while having a subnet, it allows us access into a public blockchain infrastructure with natively minted USDC, et cetera. Uh, that's an additional benefit, but that's really our driver. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously I couldn't have said it better myself, but um, I think we often talk about, you know, subnets and their capabilities in terms of pro providing institutions and enterprise use cases, the best of both, um, you know, public blockchain infrastructure and development with the more kind of enterprise specific chains that a lot of institutions are used to building on. But I think you guys are a prime and frankly, first institutional example of of um, a use case actually using subnets to meet whether it's regulatory considerations, other internal considerations that um, you know that are particularly relevant for institutions. I think you know these these specific examples help to make um, some of those things more concrete. So whether it's permissioned validator set that that's been KYC that's based in the U.S. jurisdictionally and or we didn't talk about necessarily user user permissioning or user access to the subnet um, a lot of things I think you guys um, have have taken advantage of and you know to your point in terms of what you alluded to in terms of um, stable coin uh, ability to access I think a lot of these things you, you have the optionality to, to continue to, to benefit from the growing C chain, which is the public permissionless chain and, and all the integrations that, that come from there. If and when we get greater regulatory clarity, I think um, you know the optionality remains intact. So I think um, you definitely hit the nail on the head there as well, um, Siddhartha. In terms of the demo, um, Eric, I know we have a demo that we want to sure. that we want to share. 
everyone, if you want to um, play to maybe walk us through what that looks like. I, I also, I always get excited when there's actually like, not just a, a prototype, but actually a working product um, that we can share. would love to kind of have you share that and, and also just maybe walk us through what we're looking at. Um, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, and uh, maybe uh, it should be mentioned as well. Uh, and I think Sidra has touched on it. Uh, just in terms of the the product people uh, with an avalanche as well uh, have been helpful uh, in the design and development, right? So, um, you know, you're talking to folks such as yourself, Morgan, who come from a uh, financial services background, uh, some of the, uh, you know, from the top uh, down, you know, we've, we've had a great experience. So I think it's worth noting uh, in your call uh, that that's also been helpful when building out the subnet. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I think we were one of the first institutional uh, subnets designed and built. Uh, and a lot of that uh, was kind of a back and forth uh, with, with uh, your team and, and our team. Uh, so a great process altogether. But happy to demonstrate now uh, what it was that uh, that we developed uh, and uh, effective as of the 31st of January, uh, the subnet was live. Uh, and so we're working with our first uh, asset originator uh, on a pool uh, of uh, loans currently, and hopefully we'll have that up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, share my screen. And so uh, before I press play, uh, just to set the stage, right? So this is kind of the architecture um, for those uh, that uh, uh, are familiar, right? With the C chain and then the subnet, right? So this is uh, where we're, we're housed uh, here below. And we begin our, the beginner process uh, with the issuer, which is the asset originator, uh, that particular entity that's looking to raise some capital uh, against their loan. So uh, like I said, I'll, I'll get to it. So again, um, you know, we built the subnet uh, here with the marketplace uh, asset originator in mind and a lender that wants to bring in their loans in exchange for capital. Uh, first, they upload those loans into a master file uh, containing uh, underlying loan data in the contracts themselves. Uh, through which we enable that issuer to map uh, those loans to criteria filtered uh, pools for verification and deal creation. Uh, once that filtering is completed and the issuer selected the capital amount, uh, these loans then can be mapped to that pool. Uh, and now that pool of refined loans uh, can be submitted to the verification agent for review uh, and thus solving the real asset on ramp issue that uh, uh, plagues many blockchains. Uh, so we've taken a conventional loan or a OCA uh, and brought it on chain uh, for uh, further uh, processing. So here's where we have the verification agent uh, step in. This would be one of those partner banks that we currently work with. Uh, they're tasked with uh, reviewing the underlying loan contracts and certifying that the pool uh, is valid. Uh, within NJ Markets, we've integrated that process with an AI tool, reducing that manual burden as we discussed and automating the, the creation of uh, digital records. So the, the NFTs uh, being generated from this, this process. Uh, they log in, they accept the pool. Uh, the AI has, has already produced the exception report. Uh, they can review the data points. If everything matches, they simply click submit and again, create those NFTs. So now we've got a digital copy uh, of that loan and the underwriter comes into the platform. So these would be, you know, investment banks, uh, smaller uh, underwriter outfits uh, come in and, and assess the quality of the collateral loans um, and start structuring those into risk adjusted tranches based on that credit criteria and other asset components. Uh, through NT Markets, we've connected that underwriter to that digitally verified loan pool. Uh, there's some structuring tools available based on asset classes, or again, they can upload their own capital structure of that particular deal. Uh, once that structure is uploaded, uh, those payment rules are modeled as smart contracts by us. Um, and then the tranches are displayed based on that ver verified loan pool and, and the um, capital structure. So now we've got our payment rules. And from here, the underwriter can publish that offering for the issuer approval, uh, which mints the fungible tokens uh, for possible investment. So we've not exchanged capital yet. This is just creating those, those tranches for investors to, to review. Uh, so the investor, um, you know, is able to access the platform review opportunities um, that uh, kind of uh, strike their fancy, right? They can filter those uh, down to um, uh, asset class, weighted average coupon, uh, whatever criteria it is that uh, they use to assess uh, whether or not it's a, it's a viable uh, investment opportunity. But once they see an opportunity that meets their demand, they click on that deal um, and they can uh, drill down into specifics. So they'll see the payment rules, basic details. They'll see the asset category, issuer origination and concentration and the tranches themselves. Um, our investor then can drill down further as we discussed and actually look at the pools that were brought into that particular uh, tranche. Um, and you can, this is a simple sample structure, but uh, you get the gist. There could be a thousand loans that can drill down into each individual loan. Uh, but, um, you know, assuming they see something they like, they can proceed to invest and the platform accommodates that funding uh, via USDC by connecting that investor's compatible third party wallet, such as MetaMask or Coinbase, 
Um, but USDC could be replaced with uh, CBDC, RLN. That was one of the things that we piloted with the Wells Fargo um, uh, pitch, which was the ability to take that kind of uh, liability network or any other favorite digital, digital currency, right? We've created the, the optionality uh, within the platform. But we also have an off-chain settlement uh, that we've designed as well, uh, where uh, wire confirmation through the trustee uh, is actually going to uh, confirm a settlement of investment. Uh, at any point, then we would still, uh, through the smart contract, be able to uh, confirm that uh, receipt and uh, investment. And from there, the corresponding amount of fungible token is delivered uh, directly into that investor uh, wallet or the designee uh, slash custodian that they may have assigned. Um, from there, now you can see uh, you, you've got the instant settlement um, once that connection occurs. And that lower capital commitment, uh, you, you've been able to purchase into structured credit. Uh, and so from there, again, you, you see confirmation of, of purchase uh, and it's a holistic infrastructure, as we mentioned, kind of the integration of other, of the, excuse me, other counterparties. So uh, from the services perspective, you know, they're tasked with um, collecting the repayments from the borrowers on that uh, asset pool. So again, with the credit cards, fix and flip loans, whatever it may be, uh, they've got to bring in that servicer file. Uh, and we've automated that process, right? We built out the tape cracker. Uh, they simply upload that, that particular uh, Excel sheet. Typically, could come through an API, but at any event, it's uploaded into our platform, and we model out the tape cracker, thus standardizing uh, the uh, cash flow and the waterfall distribution against the smart contracts that we wrote for that particular capital structure. And so, within a matter of a, a few clicks of a button, uh, that reconciliation is already completed. And from there now, again, from an asset level perspective, those data points are going to be available from the investor. So as soon as that service information is received into the platform, I, got, I now have loan level detail uh, payment history on each uh, particular loan that's in that pool. Um, and again, we've we've connected the, the workflow, as Siddharth had mentioned, right? That, that's a lot of the heavy lifting. And so the servicer uh, you know, completes their process. And then that, in the traditional finance sense, uh, that data has to go to the trustee. The trustee then has to interpret uh, that collateral uh, performance against the governing conditions within the indenture. And again, we've automated that process. This is a lot of what we've been doing on Intent Admin. So the smart contracts are already dictating based on that capital structure and the asset class and all the rules that were, were built into the deal uh, through the governing documents, that this is the payment waterfall based on the information that we just received from the servicer. Uh, and so from there, the trustee can simply uh, hit, um, you know, approve payment and the exact amount is going to go to the uh, tranche investors. And again, um, I think from an institutional perspective, we also realized that, um, you know, that, that there's not going to be too many buyers that are likely to look at asset performance uh, and investment uh, performance through uh, an Aviscan or, or block scan, right? They're, they're going to want to have an interactive kind of uh, process mirroring what they might see in, in traditional markets. And so there we built out this robust uh, analytics engine, right? So the information that runs through blockchain is then extracted and, and presented back in a manner where uh, an investor can drill down into the asset level detail, uh, look at uh, concentration limits, uh, drill down into the single loan, uh, various charting options available. This is a, a, a real estate a transaction that's showing uh, that I can look at um, concentration by state. I can drill down to the city. I could, I could filter that by FICO score. Uh, and so, as I say, it's a very interactive kind of, a uh, database then that, that exists uh, all based off the information that was run through blockchain. Um, and so uh, that's that's our uh, subnet uh, in the quick review. Happy to answer any questions or uh, go through the process uh, uh, in more detail. That was a really good voiceover, Eric. I know it was an automated yeah. video. <laughs> Uh, I think I think beyond or beside the uh, the MetaMask uh, uh, part, everything else feels very Web two, which I get excited about because a lot of us talk about like how can we obfuscate away the Web three components and the blockchain components so that people get comfortable and really lower the barriers to entry to actually using various applications. And I think um, you guys have done a very good job about just ensuring that. That is something that is powering the transactions that you're seeing on, on your site, but it's not the feature, which um, oftentimes I feel like scares people or, or um, you know, increases like the, the hurdles or barriers to entry. So um, I think that was that was a great uh, demo to really show what the obfuscation of, of the blockchain and AI tech could, could look like. Um, so I know we're, we're kind of wrapping up with time right now, but maybe let me hand it over to both you, Siddhartha and Eric, if there's any any final words that you want to kind of leave our audience with. If if people want to learn more, how do they how do they learn more? Where do they learn more? How do they reach you guys? Um, and uh, and then we could wrap it up after that. Sure. Uh, we can share our mail IDs, plus we write extensively. So every decision we take on our design, on our architecture, on our solution, uh, we publish Medium blogs, so uh, 
Um, there's a lot of public information available about a complete design and process. Uh, we are most willing to do demos. In fact, we are amongst the few who don't sell a concept in the first call with our clients. We just tell them that have a look at the demo. This is like a six minute video and hence we had to condense it as a video. Uh, so that's really what I would want to tell everybody that uh, we'll kind of share our uh, medium blogs. They're very, very extensive uh, and happy to provide any additional information. Also just want to stress that while what you saw is Intain Markets, uh, which uh, was launched last month after that extensive pilot, which we did with Wells Fargo, this is running on the base of three years in production of Intain Admin on which deals are being onboarded every month on almost like a routine, boring web two kind of tech platform basis. That means nobody needs to do a press release for every deal that is being onboarded. Yeah, and I would uh, also just share from a viewer's perspective, if you're an asset originator or you're looking to, to um, you know, uh, use some funds to diversify your own investment portfolio, right? We, we kind of build it from an institutional mindset, uh, but then it's, think of the platform as a, as a more efficient uh, mechanism to raise capital uh, as a loan originator and then from a, a purchaser of, of uh, uh, investments that uh, obviously from a structured perspective, you can diversify your risk, right? Buffer yourself away from the single asset purchase. And now you've got structured credit, um, you know, available at, at a fraction of the cost. So uh, really, uh, you know, an, a, an infrastructure that connects uh, kind of the buy and the sell side with all of the counterparties connected uh, so that you've got the trust of the traditional markets built into a digital uh, process. Awesome. And I know, I don't know if everyone can see the the chat window, but I put a, your, um, your the link to your medium um in in this chat here so hopefully everyone can see it but if not feel free to uh, to reach out directly to me or Siddhartha and Eric I'm sure um you're okay with people reaching out to you via LinkedIn or Twitter um Absolutely. we're all we're all pretty available in terms of uh having having discussions about um whether it's avalanche subnets or or intain admin or markets but um really big thank you to both of you for joining joining us today um Love, always love talking to you guys um, and really kind of getting into the details of the platform and, and really, um, you know, what it's been able to enable and really excited for kind of what's to come for, for you guys and for the platform as well. But thank you guys uh, um, tremendously for, for joining us today. And, and thank you to the audience for, for dialing in and joining as well. Um, again, if anybody wants to learn more, please feel free to reach out to me directly or to the Intain team. And with that, we will we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody.